we're going to finish up this unit on context-free languages today by kind of doing a little bridge over to the next stage, which talks about Turing machines and unrestricted methods of computation. And the bridge is going to be talking about decidability of questions about context-free languages. And basically, you can't decide too much about context-free languages. You can decide a little bit about deterministic context-free languages. You can decide almost everything about finite state machines and almost nothing about Turing machines. So there's a hierarchy, and the ability to decide questions about them gets harder and harder as you go out from the center toward the, toward the fringe. The way you prove that a problem is undecidable, at least originally, is to use that you know, barber who shaves everybody in town except himself trick. You use the diagonalization trick. I'm leaving that for a completely separate day when we talk about Turing machines, because it needs a separate day, it needs a separate review, you need to be completely clear and not have anything else on your mind. And then we'll do the first undecidable problem, which is basically the question of whether a program goes into an infinite loop or not. That's impossible to decide. It's impossible to write a program that takes another program and tells you, will this ever infinite loop or not, yes or no. Can't get that right. You can prove that with diagonalization. Now from there, you don't want to bring out your diagonalization hammer again. You'd rather leave it in the closet and just relate that to other problems with reductions to kind of show a relationship between other problems and the problem of whether you can tell whether a program infinite loops. The hard thing is to get that relationship to switch from checking programs for infinite loops to checking very practical things about grammars, like whether grammars are ambiguous, whether two grammars have any strings that they generate in common, whether the complement of a grammar that's context-free is also context-free. All those things are undecidable, but there's no obvious connection between them and checking whether programs have infinite loops. So the bridge between undecidable questions about computer programs and undecidable questions about context-free languages is done through this famous problem called post-correspondence problem. And we did this yesterday, and I want to review what it is, remind you what it is, and I will tell you, and you have to take this on faith right now because it's a very technical and long proof, that somebody has proved that if you could solve the post-correspondence problem and decide yes or no to instances of the post-correspondence problem, then you could also figure out whether a program infinite looped or not. A solution to this would imply a solution to that first famous undecidable problem, and therefore, no one's ever going to come up with a solution to this either. That's what a reduction is. Somebody has reduced the infinite loop problem, the halting problem, to the post-correspondence problem. It's a very technical reduction that takes Turing machines and converts them to pairs of strings. It's not what we're going to do today at all. Just take my word for that reduction. But because it exists, we know that the post-correspondence problem is undecidable. And it's this which is going to give us a link to all the other questions about context-free languages. And the reductions there will be very straightforward not trivial, but at least handleable and understandable in, in one day. OK, questions? Okay, yeah? What meaning does the word post have here? It's a guy's name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to make it like a something. Um, yeah, Emil Post, I think, was his name. Yeah, when I first, yeah, when I heard this, because correspondence, right? You think it's like some, some old British, you know, Mail networking problem. <laughs> Charles Babbage figuring out that it's good to charge just five cents for a letter instead of six cents if it's going 100 miles further or something. No, it's just, it's his correspondence problem. Post had another problem that Michael Sipser mentioned in his lecture, which was a famous unsolved problem in recursive function theory, which was recently solved by some clever 18-year-old uh, who then decided not to go into math and computer science, but did, what did he say he did? Became a lawyer or a doctor? MD, a doctor. So I'm um, sure his parents are proud. And now, unlike all of the reductions, we, the PNP reductions we did, where we still don't know whether P equals NP, this, you know, we've proved. So all of these reductions. Yes, these reductions are, are, are useful. Well, they, they're all negative results in some ways, in the sense that, that when you make a reduction from the halting problem to the post correspondence problem, you do actually prove that the post correspondence problem is impossible to solve. It's not, it, well, you're, you're showing that if the halting problem was impossible to solve, then so would this one be. 
Or on the other hand, if you were able to solve the halting problem, then you, you, know, you could solve this one too. But we know you can't solve the halting problem. That's very well known. That's the diagonalization proof. That's Cantor's idea, you know, breathed into computer science. And it's definitely can't be done. Therefore, this definitely can't be done. And everything else we're going to reduce from this today won't be able to be done at all. No programs ever to do that. So these are negative results. It's bad that you can't do all these things. But it's important to know that you can't do them so you don't spend any time trying to do them. And so that you spend time trying to do at least the approximation of things that might help you to handle the things that you can't actually do. So let's look at this problem so everybody knows what it is. Here's what you get in the post correspondence problem. You get a list of strings that come in pairs. One from column A, one from column B. And the list can be very long. In this case, I just made a list of three. But it's arbitrarily long how long the list is. And you're given this list. And the question is, can you take a sequence of these numbers so that when you connect all the A's in that sequence, you get the same string as when you connect the B's in that sequence? Okay. So for example, let's try to, uh, to take the sequence 1, 1, 2. That would give us a 1, a 1, and a 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. A 1, a 1, and a 2 would give us uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And do they match? No, they don't match. So that doesn't work. The sequence 1, 1, 2 doesn't give us a match of the A column and the B column. Okay? So here's one instance, one input to the post correspondence problem. Here's another input. I put two of these up because I want you to at least get a sense of what it feels like to try to solve the post correspondence problem. There's no algorithm that does it, but you as human beings can stare at these two particular instances and try to solve it anyway. The fact that there's no algorithm doesn't mean that we can't solve a particular instance. We might be able to. It's just that you can't write a general set of rules that's going to solve all of them even though you might figure out the secret behind each of these. The question is, does every setup match? No. Is there one setup that makes the A's and the B's match up? Oh, just one. Just one. If you can find one, the answer is yes. If you can't find any, the answer is no. You yeah, Joe? No. No. For example, if, if, if A and B both had the same string you know, on either side, then you'd be done right away. You just pick that one string, you're finished. So it doesn't have to use all the strings. And you can use a string more than once. Well, where did this come from, this problem? Why would anybody make this <laughs> <laughs> Well, the halting problem is kind of technical and hard to make reductions from. Because to make reductions from it, you have to take an arbitrary Turing machine and convert it to a grammar. That's hard to do, and it's a little ugly. And even when you do it, it's, it's technical. But this is simple and pure and distills the undecidability of the halting problem down to its kind of elemental bare bones. And because we have it in such a simple way, I'm going to be able to describe reductions to you that immediately imply that all these interesting questions about grammars are hard to do, specifically because I have this starting point. So, so the scientists here were looking for something simple like this. They were hoping because they knew that if they got something like this, they could branch over to context-free grammars. So they're looking for it. So they look at the Turing machine and see, how could I distill it down to something like this? This looks like it's hard. There's variations of this problem, by the way, that aren't hard. Like, if I have it over just one symbol instead of ones and zeros, just zeros for all the strings. Everyone understand that variation? So just zeros. Basically, you have a number on each side. That you can definitely solve. That's decidable. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the goal again is come up with a string of ones and zeros. No, 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 no. A, a sequence of these numbers. A sequence of, the, of what are the numbers? One, two, and three. Okay. Oh, the rows. Row numbers. A sequence of rows so that when you connect the A's together, they equal what you get when you connect the B's together. And you just have to find one such sequence. All right, so I'm throwing it to you uh, just to get you warmed up a little. Which one of these is the answer yes? Which is the answer no? Uh, if the answer is yes, can you show me how to solve it? If the answer is no, can you give me some explanation why you think the answer is no? And I'll give you a hint. One of them, the answer is